guys. So in today's episode, we're going to talk about a chapter of food resources. So um, hopefully you'll find this video useful. What I'm going to do is kind of like a summary of the entire chapter. And yeah, do let me know if you have any questions down in the comments below or you can DM me your questions on Instagram. And without further ado, let's start. So in this chapter of food resources, uh, the overarching question is, is technology a panacea for food shortage? Alright, so um, in order to unpack this question itself, we have to first ask ourselves a couple of questions uh, surrounding food shortage. So first of all, what causes a food shortage, right? So is it just a case of there's more demand than supply or are there any other um, underlying problems that can actually result in this global phenomenon? So first unpack the causes followed by the impacts and consequences of food shortage on individuals as well as on the country itself and lastly we're going to look at what are some of the proposed solutions and strategies that countries can actually adopt to address this issue of global food shortage all right so without further ado let's start with the causes of food shortage whenever i ask my students about the issue of food shortage uh, the common response that i get from them would be that oh there's more demand and supply and because of the fact that there's no equilibrium uh, therefore it results in global food shortage now that's one of the reasons uh, but beyond that it's also important to recognize that food shortage can be caused by multiple reasons such as if we look at the rate at which food supply is increasing it's actually slower than that of the rate at which the demand is increasing so that's another thing to explore and next would be that there's unequal access and distribution of food supply especially to the rural uh, remote um, LDC communities so we're going to that later but um, before all this let me just take some time to explore uh, gateway one with all of you because a uh, common question that I always get from students would be how is Gateway 1 relevant and how is it going to be tested in exams? So um, when it comes to Gateway 1 uh, the inquiry question is how and why have food consumption patterns changed since the 1960s and in particular we're looking at DCs versus LDCs and also uh, the emerging economies so um, common questions that students tend to ask me would be how is this actually relevant to food shortage and how can we use this information to help us explain our answers when it comes to um, talking about um, food shortage itself so if we recall what we've mentioned just now food shortage occurs when food demand is more than food supply so this gateway is important because by understanding the food consumption patterns particularly in the developed as well as uh, the emerging economies um, we will then be able to justify why there is a sudden and rapid increase in specific food types so um, in this case let's just uh, break it down so basically in DCs and emerging economies because of the rapid economic development uh, the disposable income has been increasing drastically for individuals and because of this the purchasing power has been greatly increased as well so this would therefore lead to an increase in consumption of specific food types and in particular I'm talking about non-staple food items such as meat as well as organic food items so organic food items I mean it's increasing in recent years but the bulk of it, it is still non-staple food items so um, the reason why we need to focus on this is because countries like India and China, uh, the demand for meat has been increasing drastically and has added a lot of pressure to the agricultural sector. So um, the reason why there is such an increase in the demand for meat is not only because of the fact that people have more disposable income, but it's also a cultural perception that meat is all, um, often associated with wealth and status. So um, let's just look at an example of increased demand for beef. Okay, so uh, this will actually add on a lot of pressure onto the cattle farmers uh, because cattle farming requires a lot of different resources not just land manpower water you also require a lot of animal feed and in this case um, minority are actually grass fed but most of the cattle and cows are actually fed with corn so corn itself you also require a lot of land to actually grow the corn and um, apart from just um, using it for human consumption now corn majority actually goes to um, agricultural farms to be used as animal feed and 
part of it also um, turns into biofuel crop and only a minority is actually used for human consumption. So if we think about this on a macro, if there is increased demand for certain food types, it can actually have implications in other areas as well. Alright, so... Um, Therefore, it's important to understand that economic development of countries, the way people consume their food in certain countries can actually have an impact globally and this can actually lead to food shortage, especially for certain food types. Okay, so next we have the social factor which is just to explain how why there is in general an increased demand for food and the reason is simply because of population growth. Now, the statistics to remember would be that by by 2050, uh, the world's population will reach up to 10 billion people. So in this case, um, it's also important to recognize that population growth is most rapid within the LDCs. And in LDCs, most of them are actually heavily reliant on subsistence farming. So subsistence farming suggests that they're using traditional farming methods. Um, they are heavily reliant on um, manual labor. They're using traditional farming tools. And therefore, the output is actually very limited. So in the case that um, there is actually greater number of people which suggests greater demand, um, will they be able to produce sufficient food to cater to this increasing demand? Not so and therefore this can actually lead to food shortage particularly within the LDCs. Alright, next we have food shortage occurs when food supply is increasing at a slower rate than that of food demand. So our focus here is on food supply. Alright, so we have three main categories, economic, political as well as physical. So first thing first, it can be explained with the fact that cost of fertilizers and transportations um, are increasing. And because of this, um, think about this, if fertilizer cost is actually increasing, it suggests that more and more agricultural farmers are not able to afford and therefore they may have to rely on the natural fertility of the soil which actually takes a longer period of time which therefore suggests that the harvest within each year may be reduced and therefore this can have a direct implication to the rate at which food supply is actually being produced. And next we have the increase in global demand for biofuel crops. Um, now in this case we are referring to corn, sugarcane and palm oil. Um, why is there an increased demand for biofuel biofuel crops is because biofuel is seen as an alternative source of energy and it is more environmentally friendly but in this case if we are producing them at a large scale it suggests that we will have less land set aside for growing of crops for human consumption at the same time if you look at the type of crops corn can actually be used as um, a type of food source for human beings but um, corn has been um, used for many different purposes nowadays um, not only for biofuel crops like I mentioned just now it is also used as animal feed to cater to the increasing demand for meat and because of this um, only a small portion of corn is actually used for human consumption so this actually exerts a lot of pressure onto the global food supply for human consumption and therefore uh, this is one important factor as well all right next we have political um, now basically it's pretty straightforward if there is civil war unrest or in stability uh, this can actually have a direct impact on the food supply of the country because imagine if agricultural farmlands are actually destroyed so in this case it can actually have direct consequence on the availability of local food supply and um, next we have poor governance so this point is important because imagine if a country's government actually prioritizes other developmental needs over uh, food security or stability of food supply within the country, uh, this would suggest that less financial resources will be set aside uh, to invest in the agricultural sector or um, less funding will be provided for R&D to intensify food production within the country and therefore in the occasion if let's say uh, there is an increase in demand for certain food type or um, let's say if um, there is natural disaster that occurred in other countries that are the primary source of their food supplier, then in this case, um, this country might actually experience um, severe food shortage for that particular food type or even just food shortage on a whole. So, um, 
the political factor itself is also important to consider whenever we talk about food supply. And lastly, we have physical factors, also known as environmental factors. Now, we have two points. First, we have climate change. And next, we have um, the environmental challenges brought about by Green Revolution. So, um, when we talk about climate change, we have explained this in the chapter of weather and climate. With increased um, global temperatures, this can actually lead to increased frequency and intensity of extreme weather events such as heat waves as well as tropical cyclones. So this can actually lead to destruction of agricultural farmlands which can therefore um, have a direct impact on the food supply that's available. Um, the next point that's stated in the textbook, now this point itself is important but do take note, uh, for seasonal melting of glaciers, it's only applicable to agricultural farmlands that are located at the base of mountainous regions. So this is not a point to use if you're trying to explain about the global impact of climate change on food supply. All right? It's only affecting certain um, communities and certain countries uh, they are heavily reliant on glacier melt for their water supply for their agricultural crops. So yeah, do take note of that. And um, for both points, do note that um, the LDC communities are the most vulnerable. And the reason is because if you think about LDC's farmers, uh, they are heavily reliant on um, the natural physical environmental conditions. So they rely on the rain for um, water for their agricultural crops. They rely on the temperature. They rely on the natural soil fertility. Um, and therefore with climate change, this can actually alter the rainfall pattern. It can actually um, put them at risk uh, because they don't have uh, the financial capacity to invest in technological advances such as greenhouse or to invest in HYV seeds and things like that to allow them to be more um, prepared to counter uh, the erratic changes in terms of the climatic conditions around the world. Um, and it's only going to get worse. So um, especially for the LDC farmers, this point is actually um, something that we can consider when we are trying to explain our answers. All right, and next we have long-term environmental challenges due to green revolution. I'm going to talk about that in greater detail later, but do understand that green revolution um, can actually lead to environmental fact, um, consequences such as uh, eutrophication, water logging, as well as salinization. Um, if all this technology are not used in a sustainable manner, so if you use a fertilizer excessively, then it can lead to eutrophication, which is also known as algae bloom, and all these um, environmental consequences, they are irreversible. So um, we will talk more about it later. Okay, and lastly, we have unequal access uh, or distribution of food supply. Now, this is actually referring to the LDC communities that are more rural or remote that are hard to assess to and therefore without proper um, transportation infrastructure and without proper storage facilities, um, even though there is sufficient food supply, um, they can still experience the problem of food shortage because the food supply cannot get to them, especially um, when they are um, running low in their local food supply. All right, So that's something for us to consider when we are trying to explain about the causes of of food shortage. Next, we are going to look at consequences of food shortage. Now, I won't go into depth with this because uh, it's pretty straightforward when you read through um, this explanation in Gateway 1. So basically, uh, the consequences include things like health consequences like malnutrition and starvation and then economic consequence on individuals and on countries. So do um, make sure that you specify them, especially look through the question itself. Sometimes the question demand actually specify um, explain the economic impact of uh, inadequate food consumption on individuals. Then in this case, you've got to really focus in onto things like job opportunities as well as um, education opportunities uh, being limited due to poor health and therefore in the long run, this can affect their income and things like that. Okay, and um, of course, uh, the impact on countries and the political impact 
um, such as social unrest because of the fact that a hungry man is an angry man, <laughs> all right? And of course, you have the social impact, um, such as um, the social problem of scavenging that's occurring in certain parts of um, LDC, such as Philippines. And um, yeah, um, this will actually lead to uh, greater uh, problems in the long run, especially when we are looking at um, health problems of the communities there. All right, so um, consequences of food shortage, I wouldn't go into depth. Um, that falls under uh, Gateway 1, under the part where you look at the impact of inadequate food consumption. And at the same time, you also do notice that your textbook does focus on overconsumption, right? If there is actually overconsumption in DCs, what are the consequences? Same thing, the different categories would be health implications, so you have the problem of obesity, and then you have economic consequence, which is similar to that of what we've just mentioned, lower productivity, um, loss of educational opportunities, which can therefore in the long run affect the person's uh, income and standard of living, so things like that. So just do look through them in the textbook, they're straightforward, so I won't go through that. Okay, and uh, let's move on to something that I just want to spend some time to discuss and that is this issue on... Alright, so the key understanding over here is that food shortage primarily affects the LDCs communities as well as a small percentage of individuals from the developed countries. And um, my main concern is why exactly uh, is it affecting the LDC communities? So if you use this as a summary point, you should realize that these are the four main reasons to justify. So first of all, it's because of the rapid population growth rate within the LDC communities. And because of this, it suggests that the demand for food is increasing rapidly as well and they must be able to provide sufficient food supply and if not therefore they will actually experience um, significant amounts of food shortage and next would be the fact that in LDC communities they are primarily practicing subsistence farming and subsistence farming like I've mentioned before it suggests that the output per unit area is actually very low and the fact that they are relying on traditional farming tools rather than using farming technologies this actually suggests that they will not be able to intensify their food production to cater to the demand of the rapid population growth. Okay, and um, next would be that they're heavily reliant on physical factors. So they are reliant on, like I said just now, the climatic conditions, the soil condition, as well as the availability of rainfall. And this puts them very much in a vulnerable spot, especially when it comes to um, climate change. And lastly, because of the fact that they are less developed, they often have a lack of financial resources to invest in agricultural technology as well as to invest in proper transportation as, as well as storage facilities and infrastructures. So because of this, uh, you do notice that um, they are not able to intensify their food production and number two is that even if they are reliant on food aid and um, uh, they are getting um, imports from other countries, uh, they will not be able to effectively distribute it to the local citizens due to the lack of proper transportation infrastructure. And even if there is proper transportation infrastructure, if they do not have uh, proper storage facilities, then all those perishables will not be able to last for a long time. And therefore, this will only worsen the problem of food shortage. Alright, so um, these are a couple of points for you to consider when you are trying to justify why in an LDC um, context, uh, food shortage is very much more prevalent as compared to um, in communities within the DCs. Alright, so is technology a panacea for food shortage? Now, like any other overarching question, there are two sides to it, right? So, yes, it can be a panacea for food shortage, especially given the fact that it can enable intensification of food production. Um, now, when it comes to intensification, this term actually um, is not difficult to understand. Um, basically, there are two things that you need to know. 
Firstly, it can either mean that you are able to increase your output per unit area or it means that you are able to reduce your input per unit area. So what this means is that imagine you have the same amount of land. All right? The land remains the same, but if you are able to increase output, meaning if you are able to increase your harvest, the amount of crop production, then you are able to intensify fruit production. Or if you're able to reduce input per unit area, that means given the same amount of land, if you're able to reduce the amount of resources you invest in it, so things like manpower or water, if you're able to reduce input for that given amount of land and yet produce the same amount of output or even more, and then this would suggest that you have successfully intensified food production. Okay, so technology allows intensification of food production to be possible in the first place. So how? It is usually true commercial farming, uh, basically farming that's practiced on a large scale that's usually adopted by agribusinesses such as the company of Dole or you can call a uh, company of Sunkist. All right? So companies like that, they usually have a global network of um, farms as well as uh, the production plan as well as the distribution plan and they do have financial resources to invest in R&D and inventing different types of agricultural technologies to help them to make the processes more efficient things like that and um, yeah Intensification of production usually um, is um, made possible because uh, with technology, you can actually implement things like the use of high yielding variety seeds or fertilizers or pesticides or irrigation and mechanization. And all this, plus the fact that you have things like greenhouses or you have biotechnology, right? Like um, this is something that most of you like to talk about, GM food, right? And um, um, as well as proper storage facilities and all that, it allows us to be less vulnerable to or uh, less reliant on the physical factors and therefore we can effectively overcome all these possible challenges like climate change and things like that. Alright, so... Um, Technology is definitely something uh, that can help us boost uh, the global food supply. Given that there is actually greater demand, uh, there is a need to increase our food supply drastically so that every country has um, food security and stability in the food supply. Right? However, um, before we move on, it's important to recognize that in order to actually implement um, technology, um, you actually need financial resources and is usually implemented in DCs. Okay, and at the same time, you also require strong cooperation of stakeholders as well as strong political willpower. So, um, usually you tend to notice that when we talk about technology, uh, we do not really bring in LDCs or countries that are experiencing conflict or countries that have poor governance. So, basically, the other side to this question is that technology may not be a panacea for food shortage because implementing technology can indeed increase food supply but it doesn't address the issue of unequal access and distribution of food supply all right so um, that's one thing to note and next would be that yeah we've just mentioned technology is too costly for ldcs to implement and um, if you don't implement it sustainably um, this can actually lead to long-term environmental consequences that may be irreversible and in this case for instance if you use irrigation excessively and not in a sustainable manner, this can actually lead to water logging or it can lead to salinization, which in the long run will actually cause the particular plot of land to be no longer suitable for agriculture. So in this case, then you are restricting the amount of land, arable land that's available, and therefore you can actually hinder the uh, food supply in the long run globally. Okay, and next would be eutrophication. If you actually use um, fertilizers excessively, in the long run, if there is actually surface runoff and um, all these fertilizers 
chemical fertilizers in particular are actually being washed into the water bodies such as the rivers and the lakes it can actually lead to algae bloom also known as eutrophication and this can actually block out sunlight and actually cause um, everything that's beneath the surface of the water to um, eventually die so this can actually cause irreversible impact on the ecosystem itself so these are some of the things for us to consider and to really understand that um, technology has its advantages however the criteria is that it must be used in a sustainable manner all right so for the conclusion um, therefore, when implemented sustainably, technology can be a panacea for food shortage as it can drastically increase the global food supply to meet the increasing global demand. Alright, so if food shortage is actually caused by the fact that there is more demand than supply, then um, by boosting the supply, you can certainly use technology uh, to overcome the problem. However, um, if you think about the implementation of technology it is important to recognize that it's costly and therefore in LDC context if they're experiencing food shortage um, then um, technology might not be the most viable option so instead they can rely on agricultural policies such as multiple cropping crop rotation as well as water and soil conservation and the reason is because since LDCs are very much reliant on traditional farming methods um, this type of um, agricultural strategies would be useful in helping them increase their output in a sustainable manner as well. All right. However, in order for agricultural policies to be effective, you actually need strong political willpower. So you need the government to be supportive as well. Okay, so next would be leasing of farmland. Now I wrote this here because um, most commonly you get this point um, when you are trying to justify uh, for developed countries that have limited amount of land, they can actually buy land from other countries. But if you come from the point of view of the country that's leasing out the land to the DC, um, this can actually be a feasible strategy because uh, it can actually help to increase the country's financial capacity. So if I lease my land to you, I can actually use this amount of money to invest in the agricultural sector of my own local uh, community and therefore this can actually help to increase the local food supply. Alright, so that's something for you to consider. And lastly, we have population control. Now, I don't really um, fancy talking about this point because in my opinion, it is a long-term strategy and um, it doesn't have a direct impact on addressing the problem of food shortage. Um, but I do understand where this point comes from because um, since rapid population growth is an issue and this actually drives the demand and therefore if there's population control this can actually reduce the demand in the long run which can help to address the issue of food shortage but my concern is that um, high birth rates are actually found in LDCs and um, in order for population control to be effective you actually require the citizens to cooperate and many times if we really understand about the LDC communities uh, because of the low literacy rate the cooperativeness of the citizens are relatively lower and um, in this context you also require a lot of financial resources um, to be pumped in by the government uh, to ensure the effectiveness of the policies I mean, if you really think about this, it would not be the best strategy if you really want to help an LDC overcome the problem of food shortage, right? So, um, of course, you have other things like um, encouraging the country to turn to other international organizations for food aid and all that. And all these are temporary short-term measures. They are not sustainable in the long run. So at the end of the day, I would say that out of all these different strategies, agricultural policies would be the most useful and most practical for them. However, you require the government to uh, be able to support the local farmers as well. So um, yeah, um, there is no one-size-fits-all kind of strategy. So um, different countries will actually turn to different strategies to help them overcome the issue of food shortage or simply to just ensure that the country have stability of food supply. So in Singapore's case, what we are doing is that we are trying to diversify more of our food sources um, to have more countries um, 
exporting their food supplies to our country so that in any occasion where for instance one country experienced a natural disaster at least our food supply is not drastically affected all right so these are some of the key points for the chapter on food resources so i hope you found this video useful as a form of summary or recap and yeah do let me know if you have any questions or if you need to clarify anything and all the best for your revision and we'll see each other in the next video which will be the last content video on the chapter of health and diseases and yeah 